Okay, History 6C. Let's talk about slavery. Um, clearly a very sensitive issue, guys, but let's, let's see if we can get objective and, and see if we can define the terms for this, okay? What we're going to be talking about is the slave trade, the slave trade called the Triangle Trade or the West African Slave Trade. It is when Europeans brought Africans over to the New World as slaves, uh, starting in the 17th century through the 19th century. Now, before we go there, let's define our terms, all right? Slavery. Slavery's been around for a very long time, probably since the earliest of civilizations. Slavery is forced labor, forced labor. Whether it's five minutes or 50 years, it doesn't matter. Slavery is when you force somebody to do something with no compensation, in which they have no choice, but they have to do what they have, they're told to do. Um, throughout most of history, uh, in most places of the world, uh, history, slavery has uh, at least two, two causes, two reasons. Um, one is either economic or one is military. Um, in many societies, you become a slave, which means you become a laborer, forced laborer for a person or for the community because of economic times, poor times. You're broke, you're in debt. Um, the ancient Greeks used to be able to sell family members off into slavery to, sell, to, uh, to pay off their debts. Um, it is a common way in many societies. Uh, the other form of slavery is usually military. You're, you're in battle, you're defeated, you're captured, you become a slave of the victor, and you become forced slaver. Um, Slavery itself is not unique, but what is unique about the West African slave trade, the trade that we are talking about, is not so much what it is, but why it is. The West African slave trade uh, is unique because it's not based on economics. It's not based on whether you're poor or rich. It's not based on warfare. It's not based on whether you're defeated in battle and you're a captured enemy. It is based purely on race. It's this idea that certain races of the world are superior, Certain races are inferior, and the inferior races should be the laborers for the superior races. That's what it's based on. Um, it's known as chattel slavery. Chattel slavery, based purely on race. And that itself is a rather a Western, unique form of slavery. It comes from Western society. And it be developed in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. Uh, there's a lot of theories for this. Um, uh, the, the traditional theory was that Westerners were racist. They saw other people as being inferior, um, and then they enslaved them. Now, if you believe that, and we haven't got time to do all African history here, but if you do, if you do believe that, and many people did for many hundreds of years, the problem with that theory is if, if you believe it, you disregard over 2,000 years of European African history, in which Europeans and Africans did business together, they worked together, they even fought together. Uh, during the Crusades, Africans and Europeans fought against the Muslims. Um, so they, they, they fought together and they worked together. Um, so another theory is that Europeans got involved in the slave trade, the, the West African slave trade, and then they began to develop a theory, a rationale, coming out of the Enlightenment. They had to rationalize everything. And, and they had to rationalize why can we do this? Why are we doing this? And, and they came to the conclusion after you know, uh, many years, that, that they, they create this argument of race superiority. That our race is superior. God made it this way. Or if you weren't particularly religious, you said nature made it this way. We are meant to be at the top and they are at the bottom. That's the way it's supposed to be. Um, this theory is applied, begins to develop in the 17th, 18th through the 19th centuries. Now, we're going to develop this and look at this in, in two basic ways, three basic ways. We're going to look at Africa first, briefly. And we're going to look at Europe, um, and then we'll look at the Americas and, and this slave trade. So, define it. First of all, we're talking about the triangle trade. Europeans going to Africa, picking up slaves, bringing those slaves to the New World, where they worked primarily in sugar plantations, tobacco plantations. After 1793, when Eli, Wallach, uh, Eli Whitney, well, that's a good actor, when Eli Whitney invents the cotton gin and makes it profitable to process cotton, cotton becomes king, in, especially in the southern colonies and states of North America. So they came over for the, to labor in, in those products, those very profitable products. Those products were then sent to Europe where they were sold for a profit, and those uh, profits were used to buy more slaves, and so you have the triangle trade, or the West African slave trade. Um, 
before we go into the details of how it was organized, let's look at the basic numbers here. Now, how many slaves are we talking about? How many Africans are we talking about? The number varies. I've heard as much as 50 million. I've heard as many as 11 million, as low as 11 million. Um, a good count, a conservative count would be probably from the year 1500 to 1900. And we can go up to 1900 with slavery because Brazil had legalized slavery up to 1896. Um, so up to 1900, a good conservative number is about 14 million. Now, how come we don't know for sure? Well, because records weren't always kept that well, um, because we know that many ships, um, if they broke out of disease, the, 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 the captain would simply order to have the, the African slope thrown into the ocean. Um, slaves were smuggled. So we don't, we don't know how many lived, how many died. Um, so the number is not exact. But let's say it's 14 million. Um, that's a huge number. When you think that, and you say, well, that's over 400 years. Well, yeah, but, but when you split that up over those 400 years, it comes up to a little bit about 1%. And what that means is about 1% of West African slaves, primarily young, primarily male, primarily healthy, were stripped from uh, West Africa, brought to the New World. We're talking about in a West African society, we're talking about the leaders, we're talking about the future innovators. So um, it really was the cream of the crop that was taken from West Africa and brought to the New World. West Africa has never really recovered, even to this day, from, uh, from a really a retardation of their progress because of this. But having said that, let's start to, the, to look at the details here. First of all, let's look at West Africa. We're talking about West Africa, guys. We're talking about the bend in Africa and West Africa. We're talking about countries like Sierra Leone, Nigeria, Ghana, all these countries along the west coast of Africa. That's where primarily all the slaves come from. Most African Americans today, if they trace their roots back to Africa, it would go to West Africa. West Africa had slavery. Um, in some areas, it was a minor part of the economy. In other areas, it was a major part of the economy. In uh, major empires like uh, Dahomey, uh, the Ashante in West Africa, slavery was a very, very important part of their economy. Uh, the Ashante, known as great warriors, um, they conquered their neighbors and they took slaves, and those slaves became laborers. Uh, the kingdom of Dahomey, West Africa, probably even uh, larger than the Ashante. Um, was primarily an agricultural society, and they gained most of their workers as uh, laborers, slave laborers, that they gained through conquest. Their forms of slavery um, were traditional. They were economic, they were military, and um, that's not to say any form of slavery is good, it's not, it's horrible, but the distinction, understand the distinction here. We're not talking slavery, we're talking about the kind of slavery. When Europeans first arrived in West Africa, uh, they began to trade. The first to become involved in West Africa are the Portuguese in the 16th century. They were the first to make their way around the coast of Africa and as a result they were the first to come in contact with Africans and they were the first to start to trade. If tra at first they traded simple goods, what goods they had, whatever African goods they had, but as the colonies in the New World began to grow and there began to be more and more of a demand for labor, uh, the Portuguese began to get more involved in the existing African slave trade and they began to exploit this slave trade, um, not only buying off people but creating middlemen, paying uh, middlemen, people that had no, uh, there was no control over them from either African leaders or Europeans, really independent uh, men who uh, captured Africans and sold them to the Europeans. Um, there was a cooperation here, understand that, guys. I mean, most Europeans did not go into the uh, interior of Africa until well into the 19th century uh, for a very good reason. They died off. Life expectancy for a, a European in West Africa up till quinine was discovered in the 1860s, um, the life expectancy was six weeks. So you didn't go into the interior of Africa. Europeans uh, bought slaves or captured slaves from the coast or from coastal kingdoms. Um, and the Africans who did get involved in this, they got involved because they saw it simply as another part of a trade. They were trading with each other, they were fighting each other, and they saw the Europeans as a third party. A group that came in with what? Well, they got guns, and we could certainly use guns, we didn't have guns. So they began to trade guns for slaves and other goods. What the Portuguese figured out very quickly was, if you've got two warring tribes, say the Ashante and the Fonte, 
you can sell them goods, you can sell them guns, and you can sell them gunpowder, and they will fight each other, and they will sell you goods along with slaves. But if you were to side with one group for a while, say the Fonte, and let the Fonte take advantage of this weapons and, and attack the Ashante, uh, the Ashante, of course, would get beaten. But then after a short period of time, you switch sides. You back up the Ashante. The Ashante now can take back their revenge on the Fonte. That's not to say that African leaders didn't know that they were being played, at least uh, not for a while. At, at first, they certainly didn't know. Um, but after a while, it becomes part of a, there's a, a problem. How do you quit something like this, like an arms race? If we decide to say, you know what, we're no longer going to do this because Europeans are exploiting us or taking advantage of the situation, can you afford that your enemy will do the same? No. Um, there were independent millmen, powerful men, who had their own armies. Um, there were leaders and, and people who were making a lot of money off of the slave trade. Um, and of course, uh, Africans had no concept of chattel slavery. What they understood was the type of slave trade that they had always been involved in. Um, Europeans become involved in the 16th century with the Portuguese. Uh, in the 17th century, the largest uh, slave trading uh, nation were, were the Dutch. The Dutch had gotten involved in the slave trade because the Portuguese had stopped trading slaves because they had been invaded by Spain in 1580. So the, the Portuguese had been un, unable to continue this trade. The Dutch businessmen that they were decided to take over this trade. In the 17th century, they did. In the 18th century, it's going to be the British. The British will take over the slave trade. The British uh, take over the slave trade because it's part of their general global economic plan, which is free trade, um, trying to sell as many goods, many colonies globally, and that included the slave trade, which, which was the most profitable business in Britain in the 18th century. The beginning of the 18th century, the most profitable business in Britain was the slave trade, as we've spoken about earlier. By the end of the 18th century, they had taken that, the money, the profit from the slave trade, invested in the Industrial Revolution. By the end of the 18th century, um, there was a very strong anti-slavery movement in Britain. One reason, of course, being that they could afford it. Uh, to uh, to turn their backs on the slave trade because they were making much more money um, on industry and factories and mass production. Um, in the Americas, as colonies began to develop, they began to look for profitable businesses, profitable crops. Um, it, when they first came, of course, they were filled with legends and, and, and stories. Legends and stories about cities of gold and, and and the trees were covered with diamonds and, and there were going to be all kinds of wonderful things available to them. Of course, except for maybe Fernando, Hernando Cortez, Pizarro, who conquered the Aztecs and the Incas, respectively, um, most of the people who came over never found any kind of riches or any kind of gold. Uh, the best story that kind of links us with slavery is probably the establishment of Jamestown, the British colony in 1607. Uh, the British colony in 1607, uh, you may have heard the legend, the myth of Captain Smith and Pocahontas, which is a myth that didn't actually happen, but nonetheless, um, the story of the British colonists in 1607 coming to Jamestown, Virginia, trying to set up a colony and nearly starving to death. One reason, because they simply didn't work, but uh, there really wasn't the gold or the silver or the riches they thought was going to be there. They thought they would walk through the forest and the, the leaves would be made of gold. They'd simply pick them. Um, after about a decade or so of near starvation, near collapse, uh, the Virginians uh, uh, discovered a, a product that turned out to be gold. It wasn't gold itself, but it was worth its weight in gold, and that was tobacco. They began to plant tobacco. They began to ship tobacco over to Europe. At first, tobacco was a novelty, something you went into rich people's homes, parties, and saw it rolled up in little cigarettes on silver plates and said, oh, tobacco, ooh. But eventually, as they began to ship more and more, the price came down and tobacco became accessible to the general public. Uh, tobacco, uh, of course, has its downside. Uh, it's gonna kill you, but once it gets you as a customer, it's gonna get you for life. Yes, that life will be shorter, but nonetheless, it's gonna get you for life. So tobacco begins to become extremely profitable. Uh, comical, somewhat comical, black humor uh, type story, um, that um, um, in the 1620s, the, the people of Jamestown planted so much tobacco, 
they planted everywhere. They simply didn't plant any crops. Um, and they nearly starved to death in the 1620s. You can't eat tobacco and you can only put off hunger for so long. Tobacco becomes the profitable uh, crop. In the Caribbean, most of the northern parts of South America, the primary crop is going to be sugar, sugar plantations. Now, tobacco and sugar have a lot in common, uh, besides the fact they're both highly addictive and create customers for life. We'll continue.